But for me, when I finished school, there wasn't really a lot of opportunities to do any, there wasn't any sports degrees. There wasn't any, there was a sports science degree. And that was the only place that did it at the time, I think was Loughborough. So it was a big step up to get to that next level. But my local college, Farnborough College Technology, did a leisure management course. And I just thought, like Shelley, I want to work in sport, but I don't know what that role would be. Mm. So I'll do this as a starter for 10. And then they did a, a like a degree level science and management of health and fitness, which I went on to do afterwards, which then really helped hone in, which was the first like health and fitness qualification there really was around. So that helped hone me down that pathway of, right, I'm going to work in fitness. From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders and experts and the stories behind their business journeys. Our guests on this episode are Shelley Meehan, Head of Operations and Projects, and Sue Wilkie, Head of Instructor Support at EMD UK. EMD UK acts as the voice for group exercise instructors and organisations. Shelley established herself in local authority and national sports administration, and now works with EMD UK to lead on the rollout of strategic programmes, notably the This Girl Can Classic. Sue has worked with some of the industry's best-known brands, such as BOSU and TRF, to support the development and training programmes and product lines. Her role supporting and representing group fitness instructors have been instrumental in bringing group fitness back to the UK after the COVID-19 restrictions. During the episode, discuss the current state of the industry and look at the opportunities for the future. Enjoy the show. Okay, I'm really excited to uh, welcome our guests on the show today. We've got Shelley Mayen, Head of Operations and Projects, and Sue Wilkie, Head of Instructor Support at EMD UK, the voice for group exercise instructors and organisations. They are dedicated to achieving a healthier nation through group exercise. So welcome to the show. Thanks, James. Thank you. Yeah, we're having a good good conversation there before we started. So I feel like I've got to know you quite quite well quite quickly. But for the listeners, we normally go back a little bit and talk about um a little bit about childhood, really, go all the way back there to school days and and kind of look at things that maybe influence us as we're moving forwards in our kind of physical activity journeys. What was your I guess, how would you describe your childhoods if we could start there? I don't know who wants to go first. Go on, Shell. I don't um, there. Full of sport and activity. I know that might sound like a cliche, but absolutely a lot of my memories from childhood are either playing sport myself or, you know, messing around with mum and dad and grandparents as well. We're always quite active or, or watching my, my, I've got an older brother. So watching my older brother play football, I've got a lot of memories of that as well. So yeah, sporty, active, happy, nice. I guess, which is nice. Yeah. And it sort of feels like it was instilled at home, right? Like a, like an active family yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Mum and dad have always done like various different activities and stuff like that. And my brother's always been really sporty, and I think I just kind of followed that that footsteps. And they just encouraged me and gave me the opportunity to to try different things and to to engage in different activities, so I could work out what I liked. Yeah, well, so, so I, we've just been talking for a short time now. I can feel kind of your energy coming through <laughs> through on the Zoom. So were you always kind of like high energy and active as a child as well? <laughs> Yeah, I bet there's many people who wish I wasn't quite so high energy. But yeah, no, I was the youngest of four in my family. And uh, so I, I, similar to Shelley, was dragged around a lot of sporting pitches in my young years and kind of went to try and play. I tried everything, you know, that person at school who did every sport, who tried everything, hated some sports, loved others, and fell on the sport that I ended up progressing into at the time, which was international badminton. But athletics, you name it, all of it, tried it all. It was just part of life. And a lot of it, I think badminton I fell into because my brother played and my mum was a coach. So I was the four-year-old with a racket going around whacking people to just going, what do I do with this thing? So it's circ- it's funny how it's a circumstance of what you've done and your family have lived a life like. Yeah, They're definitely. very much an influence. It feels a bit like, yeah, destiny on that one on the badminton. You start yeah. at four years old. One of the themes we've had on, on the show previously is about is around um, girls' participation, specifically on adolescence, like coming through adolescence and kind of in, into um, adulthood. And we might touch on this, we probably will touch on it with like this girl can campaign, things like that. But for yourselves, what was your kind of experience, you know, as you went through secondary school and maybe your first experience with group exercise, if it was around that time, it'd be interesting to kind of hear your thoughts then maybe and we can talk about what it's like now when we get into the MD. Yeah, I'd, I'd almost go back a step, James, actually, to primary school for me. Okay. Because at the time, for boys' teams to play a lot of team sports, they, there was a, this kind of requirement that they had to have two girls on the team. So 
Therefore, I was on every team because I was probably the sportiest girl in school. And my best friend at the time, I'm still in touch with. It was me and my friend Louise. We would we were playing football. We were playing cricket. We were playing netball. We would do, you know, we were like Sue said, athletics, everything. So I think that kind of those first experience for me were actually for the school to be involved. They had to have girls on the team. Which, whilst that feels a little bit backwards now, actually, you know, that was kind of the start of progressing that because perhaps there weren't enough opportunities for girls to have their own teams in some sports but we were holding our own so therefore I was kind of like you know happy happy in in that vein and that kind of transferred into secondary school for me as well so kind of went to secondary school I was so used to just kind of playing sport with the boys that I just kind of carried on doing it and actually what I found was in some cases that when girls teams were set up it wasn't it didn't feel as challenging because I'd been kind of engaging with, with the boys teams as well but it allowed me to kind of help the other girls to to develop but there definitely was you know when I was at school some years ago now was more of a focus on boys activities but it was it was good to be able to be given those opportunities and I think I was massively fortunate secondary school and primary school to have had teachers who were really passionate about sports so we had a really good experience we had a wealth of different opportunities and that's, that's what I was going to ask about role chance. models in school yeah role models in school because yeah, when you said about the kind of the quota for the mm-hmm. teams yeah. I didn't know whether it was like oh, oh we'll let Shelley in because we have to rather than like <laughs> they were really I mean, they were passionate I mean, about listen, I'd, I'd, have, I'd have got in anyway yeah. <laughs> I've no doubt about that I was better than most of the boys I think at football <laughs> but I remember one PE teacher her name was Mrs Moore actually and yes. she just loved sport okay she just loved sport we didn't have a PE teacher it was primary school most primary schools don't have specialist mm-hmm. PE teachers yeah. still to this day which is, is probably a little bit for me a failing of the system but she just loved sports so she she made it happen for us and she gave us good PE experiences good extracurricular experiences good tournaments and stuff so definitely her her being there enabled that for me and then in secondary school again went into secondary school loving PE loving sport it was it was a passion of mine and I just had a really good set of a good PE department that facilitated opportunities and 100% at the time role models Awesome. What about you, Sue? What was your experience similar to that? Obviously, yeah. Well, I, I, I will say I'm, I, I'm a little bit older than you both, <laughs> so uh, the system may have been a little bit different at those times. But it, for me, sport was how I made friends at school, and the reason I say that is I had a dad who worked for a company for years, but we travelled. We had to keep moving, so I moved four times throughout my school career. So, right. and that's significant changes, as in different areas of the country. And sport was my way in to make friends because my first thing was check out what sport they've got and go and join a sports club. And so, but it was very much a boys sport and a girls sport in my era of growing up, but it was my language. That was how I communicated with sport. That's how I had relationships with people. I was that sporty person. And, and again, I completely agree. It was down to my PE teachers that molded me. I mean, I had coaches from the age of 10, but my PE teachers were more of that parent voice support of going you know you know like how your coach will sometimes push you while I was the era you were pushed very hard to achieve your best and you know failure wasn't an option whereas the PE teacher was able to be that role model of like well how are you feeling and is it serving your purpose what is your why and those things are instilled in me today of why I do sport or why I do something so for me sport was a massive positive all the way through school and it got me to try stuff that I never thought I would do yeah. beforehand and that was because I, I don't know whether it's this P teachers clicked onto the people who were good at sport and went we like them we'll help support them but I wasn't going to say no to it and they they would push you to try other things as well like do you good at athletics got a strong arm because you play badminton try javelin you know then you get to meet other people by going to like meets and stuff like that so yeah I very positive experience for me sport in school I agree. Do you know one thing that springs to mind? Sorry, just to mention it, James, is I remember being, I must have been about nine or 10 years old. And I remember being in at a netball practice in primary school in the playground. And I said to the teacher, I want to play football. I want to go to football practice. And the teacher said to me, well, you can't go to football practice because it's on at the same time as netball practice. And the football's for the boys and the netball's for the girls. I said, but I want to do football. And she said, well, you're going to have to choose then. I said, okay, I'll see you later. That's it. I was off. <laughs> <laughs> but they allowed that. They allowed it. That was just important. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that might not have been the same experience because of it. Like, sounds like your great environments around you at that point, and maybe um, other schools are not the same. But obviously, it's all changing now and getting getting better every day. What about that? That kind of. Um, that transition from secondary school into the, I guess, into work and life. I know both maybe different paths into the industry or into to EMD. Always interested to hear kind of your kind of potted history of how you got to where you are now. And I know, Shelley, you sports develop was it sports development for you? That was, yeah, that was kind of the yeah. route in. 
Yeah, definitely. So I, I mean, I left school and went to a sixth form college. Um, my school didn't have a sixth form. I didn't enjoy sixth form college, actually. Um, it's, it's just for one reason or another. And then from there, I went on to university. Um, so I went to Brighton University just to do a degree in leisure and sports studies. So for me, I had toyed with PE teaching as a career pathway, but I knew that I wanted to work in sport. I was going to say, so he's pretty, yeah, pretty kind of focused on that. But I didn't know what, because sports development at that time, I mean, I was, dare I say a date, shall we say kind of late 1990s, (laughs) early 2000s, I'll say, heading to uni, I decided to do leisure and sports studies a degree, but sports development, I think as a career was still fairly in its infancy. And so I didn't really know what pathway would be or what that would look like. And I think that's something that we kind of found as we went through. We had a sister degree course that had a work placement. And actually what we were seeing was a lot of the people that had had the work placement were getting jobs out of uni quicker than the rest of us. So but it was kind of getting that first step in. But yeah, once I kind of knew what the options were, that, that's where I went. Yeah, I think we spoke about it with a few of the guests around the same time. It's quite well-funded sports development at that time. Was, Maybe not so was. now. So there's a lot of opportunities coming up yeah. and you can step into them. What about yourself, Sue? Was yours... Well, again, going back a few days before <laughs> get the old violin out. So for me, it's funny, I didn't miss, I missed the part of the last question was, how do I get into Group X? Now this shows my age, right? Yeah, so what was that first experience? Yeah, yeah. yeah. My first experience of Group X was I lived in Lempton Spa and this thing called, right, and I was young, I will say I was young to defend my age. Z- Zumba, was it Zumba? No, right, you wouldn't even heard of it. It was called Pop Mobility. So for those oldies, they're in the room, right. there was, a, there was a, a wealth of pop mobility which you turned up at spa bars and it was really the first form of group exercise that was around it was all pop music and it was routines which then led into group x so i had this oh i love doing this to music something different than training element so but for me when i finished school there wasn't really a lot of opportunities to do any there wasn't any sports degrees there wasn't any there was a sports science degree and that was the only place that did it at the time i think was loughborough so it was a big step up to get to that next level but my local college, Farnborough College Technology, did a leisure management course. And I just thought, I, like Shelley, I want to work in sport, but I don't know what that role would be. Mm. So I'll do this as a starter for 10. And then they did a, a like a degree level science and management of health and fitness, which I went on to do afterwards, which then really helped hone in, which was the first like health and fitness qualification there really was around. So that helped hone me down that pathway of, right, I'm going to work in fitness. Yeah, I'm just curious on the t- based on the kind of the pop the is that almost like an aerobics to music like a pop music exercise to music. It was, session. it was, it was like the first one of it. It was like, do you remember that? Well, you won't remember because you're all too young. But they had the older Jane Fonda leg warmers and leotard where you wore the g-string on the outside of your leggings. That, <laughs> that was the pop ability was literally an exercise to music format, but mm. just not named it that's all. yeah i just think it so that wasn't like a friend like they like see that roll out of the franchise and stuff now i guess i'm just curious kind of going off topic in your role at the moment working with the instructors what would it have looked like for an instructor back then was it kind of just someone who's uh, working at the leisure center and given this class to deliver or were they um i, th- I think it came just, from dancers really i think it's right. going a bit full circle it was dancers who delivered them in those days because i remember the girl being at the front being able to do kick splits and i was like there's no way i'm gonna do that but it was an inspiration inspirational you know it's somebody who'd been in dance format so I've, I've kind of seen the evolution of from the dancing through to a specialized training of yeah. you know the format of there was exercise to music qualification and then there was now the group training to music qualification and there's a whole career behind it now so yeah it was more of the people who'd done dance would go into it I think at that time and it was really the first evolution of group x with I guess with your both of your journeys, I know because we because we're a bit short on time to so fit every, every, the full full stories in. How did you get involved with EMD? I guess that's probably the best the best one to to look at. So your journey into EMD and into the roles you're in at the moment, Shelley, probably probably good for you to to jump on that one first. Yeah, I'll try. I guess fitness has never been kind of front and centre for me in terms of group fitness. Put that out there. I've always been more sporty. But then I, and I've had a, a variety of different job roles within sports development and working for different types of organisations, so local authorities, charities, awarding organisations, social enterprises. I've been aware of EMD UK for some years, just obviously being, in, being within the sector. I've, I've, had, I've got personal contacts that have worked for EMD UK since kind of it started back in 2006. So it's so a very, very aware of the organisation. A lot of my roles have been kind of operational, operations focused and project delivery type focused. So actually, when I was uh, thinking about different opportunities, there was a fortunate, I guess, there was a maternity cover role that came up, which isn't my current role. It was a, it was a different, it was a digital and insight role actually. And I just thought, you know what, this, this is a good fit. It's a good, it's a good move. Why don't I do that? So I did that for a year, and then 
made yourself offered, indispensable. Basically, and yeah. then was offered the role of op, op, uh, head of ops. Classic project. move. <laughs> That's kind of what you do, isn't it? When you take yeah, a short, yeah. you take a short gig, and then and then you, you do what you can to make yourself indispensable. So if if another opportunity comes up, and that's really important. You, you, I, I hope for your listeners is that you position yourself mm. really nicely to be able to take on other other things. And I think that's why for me, you know, kind of my the experience I've gained to date is of course a quite a vast area. So therefore, I was able to give really good experiences about how what I'd done before was a good match for this role and how I knew I could be successful in it. So I guess really it was it's kind of opportunity. But for me, yeah, group exercise has never it's never massively been front and center. And actually, my my first experience is probably slightly less positive than Sue's I don't know whether I should say that or not but uh, yeah, well, I guess well, that's what you work to improve all the time isn't it yeah so, exactly so. but I think it was because of how I was asked to go and do a, a level two exercise to music course by an employer by a local authority employer there were four of us on our team uh three guys and me and our boss who said we need someone to do this qualification shall you can you go and do this because I'm female and it's exercise to music so therefore it should be me to do it I don't know actually I probably wasn't the right person I shrank to the back of the class that first teaching week, that first teaching week, I was at the back of the class. I didn't want a bar of it. it. It just wasn't me. The second week, slightly more confident, still stood at the back of the class. The third week, we did a bit more theory. By that point, I'm in my comfort zone because I'm not actually up against all these dancers. I'm actually, I know how the cardio system works. I can do that piece and I can help them. So it started to, to shift and change. So I got the qualification, didn't actually massively use it, but I'm just aware that it's always sat there as something that I accomplished that at the time. I, I didn't feel like was a good fit for me, but it was still a really good challenge for me. So I think that from a group exercise, group fitness perspective, that was the first seed, I guess, of me getting involved, but it was some, it's a good, what, that was... 10 years later before I actually started working for the governing body. And Sue, I guess, I know you do a lot of consultancy work and work with different brands and things like that. Was that kind of your way into <laughs> EMD or was... How long have you got? I'll speed date you through my <laughs> yeah. history of group exercise. I got into group exercise from going to classes and also did the course and I actually went the gym route. I was a fitness instructor first, PT. Then I became centre manager, not centre manager, but a fitness manager for uh, one of the first big rackets and health clubs in the country. Then by having kids at an early age, it kind of restricted my management growth at the time because it was you had to choose between one or the other. So I stepped, it's one word to say, but I stepped back into being studio coordinator within that role. And so for the ne- next sort of 10 years, I did, I taught a load of aerobics classes, fitness classes, you name it, elements of it. And then I got asked randomly by somebody who was in management going, would you like to be part of a demo team for a, a trade show, which at that time was Leisure Industry Week. For those of you who remember what Leisure Industry Week was up at Birmingham. And so I went up and did three demos over the three days from that. And, you know, at that time, you didn't get paid for doing a lot of stuff the first couple of times. It was about getting your face known and being out there. You got your accommodation paid for, food paid for. Then you started networking. So I actually fell into being, I think by about five years later, I was representing four brands over the three days doing 12 demos back to back, which led into people going, could you deliver this as training and education? So I became a consultant for brands in America, bringing their products here. So when you're saying brands, I'm just curious. Obviously, I've seen I've seen some of the massive demos that, like the Les Mills stuff as well. Is it was it with those type of brands we're talking about? It was it was more product placement. So the one of the companies I was working for was physical company, and they're very much a product company that you buy. Like yoga and and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah so I was doing things. I was a master trainer for Bosu, so you know the domes that a lot of people yeah. use in sports. So I travelled across Europe delivering for them with foam rolling. There was a company called Trigger Point. So very early on was with with those. There was other ones, gliding, freeform boards, you name it, whatever it was. Quick segue: Bosu balls. Which way up do you use them? Is it with the flat uh, bit on the top? See, or what does or what? Bosu stand for? Do you know oh, what it means? No, you caught me out now. Go on. Aha. Both sides utilise, but you should never stand on the platform bit. You're not Thank insured. You. Yeah, I thought I was using it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> James, you know you can't go to a trade show with Sue without every person knowing her, like literally. <laughs> we, we went to the running show, it's not even group fitness last year, didn't we, Sue? And yeah. everyone was like, hey, Sue, hey, Sue. I was like, oh, my God, like literally. I'll have yeah. to get an invite trade show, trade show queen. VIP trade access. Show, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so it, for me, it's been not, it's a series of events that have led me to it because I became a... You know, it was a development of creating programming, helping programming. Then uh, companies would ask me to write programming for their brands. So like everyone active and stuff like that. I wrote for LA Fitness. Then I actually stepped away from the industry for two years due to personal reasons. My dad was ill and had dementia. So I wanted to go and work in dementia care. Mm. And then I literally had a phone call one day to say, I found an idea. I think you'd be ideal for a job. Do you want to interview for it? And I was like, no got a job, I'm fine. And I was working in care and I was like, no, no, I think you should really do it. And it was a six month contract to come and work for EMD UK. So I had, I just said, look, I'm going to come for a meeting. That was it and see what happens. 
It was a six month job, started in February, lockdown happened in March. <laughs> Two years later, I'm still here. <laughs> Well, I get, so for you, that must have been, because you're so steeped in the industry, you must have seen, I don't know, areas for improvement, let's put it that way, if that makes sense. Is that what you put, like, kind of using now in the role with working with the instructors? I think the, the, forming the, strategy. the lucky bit I've got from my experience, I have experienced lots of different ways. I was the instructor. I have been the studio coordinator, so I understand the, the difficulties they have. I've been working in senior management in a team, so I can see where there's operational issues or, you know, like, issues we've got at the moment with I can see it from the bigger perspective mm. I can also see it from the perspective of lots of different avenues so I think that's what helps mold this role because everything I do within this role I'll go right but does that how does that affect an instructor how does that affect an operator how does that affect assume, how manageable is that so trying to find those I think that's what enables me to have a success at this role is that whole global view of it really yeah, and how does that work? I guess from uh, internally with AMD, so we had Marcus on. He gives a great rundown and an explanation of kind of the the, the strategy and what, what's trying to happen. I'm interested in terms of that. I guess I guess day to day the team how it works together. How, do you guys work closely together? Is it kind of yeah. you're implementing, you're executing on obviously strategy and the feedbacks, Shelley? How, how does it tend to work with you guys? Yeah, hundred percent. We've got a really strong team of heads of department, and we work very closely together, don't we, Sue? We each come to the table with different areas of expertise and specialism, and we lean on each other and, and work with each other to utilise our, everyone's skill sets, really, for the benefit of the organisation and achievement of those goals. So, you know, I mean, Sue and I will talk pretty much daily. Um, there's, there's contact going on across the teams all the time. We've got regular kind of senior management team meetings in place as well for us to be able to come together. But I think that, you know, we do very much work work together, you know, setting things up from my perspective, especially with some of the big projects that I manage, I'm absolutely relying on other parts of the of the organization to execute what they need to do to help me deliver kind of, I take this kind of strategic lead role on some of these things, but mm-hmm. how the, the rest of the company execute what they have to do, you know, can make or break a project. So we do absolutely, we, we look at, you know, we break down those projects, we look at what needs to be delivered, we look at how we plan that in, and then we kind of assign responsibility and then can take that forward. But there's always a check and challenge. And there is always an, um, an opportunity for what's really important to me, as one of the heads of the department at the company is to make sure that our middle managers, um, you know, our execs have, have got a chance to input and to put their ideas and thoughts forward as well, because we want to be able to hear from a lot of creative people to be able to improve what we do on a regular basis. Yeah, and I guess obviously membership organisation. What's what are the type of metrics that you use to, I guess, performance manage to make sure to make sure you are on the right right track? Yeah, there's a, there's a whole host. So first of all, because we're um, we are a Sport England funded organisation as a national governing body, um, we have a number of goals that we've signed up to over the, the course of the next five years um, in partnership with Sport England to deliver those goals. We then have our business improvement goals, which kind of sit below that. And then we've got um, a set of kind of departmental indicators and, and stuff. And that all then filters down into individuals' work plans as well. So it's kind of a, a nice, I guess, smooth process up and up and down. Um, so it feeds in together. And some of the different metrics, I guess it depends what you're looking at. Some might be based on engagement numbers, for example, on things yeah. like webinars. It might be yeah. um, number of, of members. But we also look at how often our members are engaging with us, how many touch points do we have with members what are they looking at what are they clicking on what getting feedback we do regular surveys with not just our members broader than that the sector as well but i think it's really important that we get that feedback from from partners so that we can improve what we do and if you're going to it's probably different for both different departments for that it's almost like that north star metric how do you know you're doing a great job for the for the sector and for the uh, instructors and organizations is there one thing is it kind of or would you judge yourself on growing it? More members, more more it's, partners, or the both, quality? Isn't it? I mean, yeah. we use MPS, don't we, Sue? So, yeah. um, you know, one of our measures is around MPS, and it, that's feedback from both instructors, but it's also feedback from stakeholders and partners as well. But then engagement numbers are important to us. So, so making sure that we grow, we grow, we have two kind of things. What we call what we grow our direct reach. So these are uh, instructors, you know, that we would we can communicate with on a, on, a, on a regular basis. But we also talk about our indirect reach. So when we're working with sort of you know fitness brands and member organisations and other partners, it might be that they have a reach to those fitness mm-hmm. instructors, and therefore that we can talk to them through partners. So I guess it's growing that indirect reach. It's growing that direct reach increasing engagement and touch points but then also looking at overall levels of satisfaction as well i think it's good to point out james as well we've had a massive change at emd uk that we've stopped doing stuff and st- started doing stuff so we've done a lot of stuff the reach and engagement is really important within my role because take for example the pandemic when we went to lockdown we didn't have that necessary reach and engagement to be able to represent instructors fairly we went from a we had to scale up all our proportionate and so actually it cre- allowed us to 
create sector partnerships where people want to work with us. And we had a few barriers, and but we've actually stopped doing education when now we've got a lot of people coming to us going, how can we work with you? How can we engage? How can we make things better for instructors? So that whole reach and engagement, I think, is really important because if instructors can see it as well, by them being in our network and us helping support them, we can provide them with what they need, which other organizations can't. We are their NGB. We want to support them. So come and tell us what we need to, what you need from us, and we'll try and support you through that process. Definitely. And you, I know you mentioned obviously pandemic then. I'm curious in terms of kind of the, I guess, digital transformation going online, a lot more happening on on there. How do you, I don't know if this is in your remit, so maybe it isn't. In terms of the, the quality of instructors that are out there or supporting mm-hmm. those instructors, what challenges do you have around Because I'm thinking now, about kind of the fitness influencer someone just yeah. i don't know how you can kind of control it or manage it but if someone wanted to they could put a course online put it on instagram do youtube yeah. channel whatever it was, and then they're kind of validated by their followers rather than validated by your yourselves yeah. and one of my speaker slots last week was uh, about the experience of group x and building a, a, a good value of it and that actually came up about the influencers you know we have Simspa, who are the Chartered Institute of Management Sport and Physical Activity. So if someone's on the outside looking in to come in, just make sure you're you're going to a course that is accredited by them. That's one of the things you just need to be making sure that you know you're getting a valid course because you know you can sign up for a £23 Pilates course that isn't accredited. And I don't want people going down that route and finding out that they can't go and teach because they've paid for a qualification that isn't mapped to a national operating standards. Mm. So, but there is, there's obviously room for influencers out there. There's, you know, you've got a lane and you've got a path. If that's what you do and it increases participation numbers, which is what we're also about. We want instructors to be the best they can be, but we also want to get more people act- activated in exercise, you know, what, no matter what form it is. And participation is a really important part of that. So influencers have their lane and stay in it. I just want to make sure that anyone who's coming into the industry is paying for accredited training so just make sure you got that stamp mark behind it but our whole piece of our work going forward is about how we start engaging with more people who don't exercise you know we're still 20 years on still only engaging with 15 plus percent of the population engaged in physical activity so the influencers are probably reaching some of that but we as an organization need to help provide instructors and opportunities for participants to get into exercise by helping build new projects like Shelley's done an amazing job on this girl can classes. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, what do you think the, those obviously everyone's got a different opinion, but there's probably some, some stats we can point towards, but what do you think the reason is why the, I guess the engagement and activity levels are, are lower than we'd like them to be, in your opinion? I mean, personally, uh, Shelley might disagree, but I, I just think what we, we had a, a proportion of the years that where we all that was out there in fitness was go hard or go home so whatever exercise we were doing was harder 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 you know the evolution of hit vit everything else out there yeah yeah yeah. so you're preaching to those who already converted into exercise so the issue we've got is what was the offerings that were out there were possibly too hard for people to get into exercise or a bit of a barrier. I talked about that in my discussion last week was the imagery we use in fitness. If you look at, Shelley can bring in her project in a minute, but if you look at the imagery in fit, fitness, it's always this ideal person of what you want to look like. That is a barrier to somebody who is going, I don't look like that. And, you know, whereas you think it might motivate people, it actually can be a I'm not going to go to that gym because that's not right for me. And I, I don't, I don't look and like that. That, so that distance to travel is too, the, the distance for them to travel is too far to get to that. Whereas yeah. obviously your first step is you want them to move a bit more, a bit yeah, more to exactly. start with before you get we, there. We've got to look at how we change the narrative, not the imagery, but the narrative around that and, and how we, you know, what are they uh, to understand their barriers? What is the barrier to you coming into a, any sport? What are those barriers? We can't, just sit there and assume we know what those are by so by having focus groups and working with other sector partners to understand what these barriers are to remove them i think is really important for us and so it's a great time to probably talk about the, the campaign as well this girl this girl camp project and uh, just before we go on to that because I'm, I'm curious in terms of how we're doing it um obviously there's imagery but also is there is there kind of operational things or protocol well, not protocols but for someone who's in you want to say group X, I won't say group X, so I'm getting the right get, <laughs> getting the right terminology. If someone who's in that, is there any kind of, I was thinking about the setup, right? So if you're doing a great session, for someone to turn up and feel welcomed and engaged and not being off-put by anything, so if, like, you might think, 
having a class where it's fully glass and the whole gym's looking into it and all that type of you know, is there anything around that where you think you're like these are kind of maybe not best practices or are you pushing to say we should be working this way rather than that to, yeah, to improve the experience so, entry? Yeah, definitely. This the this girl can campaign has developed a whole a stack of brilliant insight around some of the barriers to women engaging in sport and physical activity but also group exercise and at the start of the this girl can classes project we kind of followed that up with some more in-depth insight as well and, and that threw out a whole host of barriers such as yeah big mirrors at the front of the class glass massive floor to ceiling glass windows halls that were overlooked the accessibility of of centers um and, and classes timetabling uh scheduling of classes cost you know, you know some you of know, these barriers. I, I always notice one as well, and, and I'm oh. not. But I do go I do do certain classes sometimes. But what I've always noticed is that everyone who's in the class, kind of, you know, if you're just turning up as a new member to, to a gym, or you kind of, you get the feeling everyone knows what they're doing. Yeah, yeah and it's just kind of taken for granted that oh, the classes at that time you just yeah. turn up and join in, and everyone's just kind of getting on with it. So that kind of yeah, and, and that's why yeah, that's why in developing our workforce training, we've focused on the soft skill development as well for the instructors. So we've we've kind of flipped it. So rather than often when you might walk into a class and this is a real stereotype. So I think it does exist is that you walk into a class and the instructors head over the stereo, trying to sort out their mic or trying to find a piece of the mic or fit the batteries because someone's run off with the batteries from the previous classes. These are, these are like normal things that happen. Century problems, <laughs> yeah. This, this, yeah, yeah. This, this is the reality of it. So therefore when somebody new comes in, if there's a little bit of a group that know each other, they might be, you know, nattering about what they've been doing or what they did at the weekend getting or whatever. Getting all their weights out and their equipment yeah, it, set you know, up for themselves. It feels yeah. quite intimidating. So what we've done is we, we've we tried to remove those barriers. First of all, by saying the instructor needs to meet meet people outside the class. So outside the door, not in the studio, meet them outside. Right. Actually making sure that the reception staff, if it's a centre-based class rather than a community class, are brief about this is this class. So if somebody comes and asks you about this girl can class, is, you know, talk to them about it. Don't just kind of say... It's up the stairs, around the corner, along the corridor, take the left, take the right. You'll find them at the end of the corridor. You know, give them them a bit more time to build their confidence. But really then getting the instructor to start a conversation with the whole group and to, I guess, really just reassure people that that we we kind of use these strap lines that everyone's in it together. That you know, it's okay to go the wrong way. That, do you know what? Just that we're just we're just here, we're here to have fun. We're not here to we're here to try stuff out and to and to work together and to be kind of work as a team. So I think what we've tried to do with the the whole narrative around and the marketing around this girl fan class is is to turn that dial down from where Sue was um, yeah. and say you know it's open, it's welcoming, it's friendly, it's non judgmental, and it's a, it's a safe space. So therefore, you can come along, you can get involved, and you can try different formats of group exercise to build your confidence and build your fitness. You can then start to think about well, actually now maybe I'm ready to go on to a another class that might be a full 45 minutes or, or an hour for example yeah and in terms of the in terms of the program how is it rolled out is it emd taking care of the training side yep. and everything resources <laughs> oh, you just talked about, yeah. yeah the whole lot so we i mean this has been built from scratch by us a, a team of people you know too many to name but we have developed the workforce training and are rolling out the workforce training that's our primary responsibility is to do that and and we then work with instructors and we work with leisure operators, private clubs, whoever wants to deliver it basically to then help them with marketing support and marketing activity, which includes like paid social to be able to start to market the classes and advertise the classes. We're then, you know, continuing to give that guidance support. We're continuing to, to try and develop new content. And, and you know, we're a, we're quite we're a small team. We don't have we're not we're not a, a Les Mills machine. You know, they they do some brilliant stuff and have some, you know, have some great great kind of sub brands of, of what they do but we're a small team so we've got to be realistic about how much content we can develop and how much we can put out there but really our aim is to support those instructors to be able to engage with the right target audience but yeah it's us it's us doing it from from, from start to finish but it's, i mean it's been fantastic to be involved in and, and, and i know from my perspective i've learned so much oh, from working on this project agree i agree and, and the nice thing about it is we're not too shy to go ah, that's really good feedback. Let's change that for the next release. And so the program is continually evolving. And I, it's like a, a speed dating through how to get it right for engaging with people who are inactive. And, and it's great because people, have the barriers removed, they're opening up to us sort of saying, this worked for me, this didn't do it. We are participants saying, you know, it's, simple things you don't think about is I can't get on and off the floor. You know, where, you know, if you think someone puts a class together, say yoga, you do the sun salutation and, and stuff like that. There's people who can't do that. You don't think about that because you're not in their shoes. So mm. I think what's really good about the program is it's continuously evolving and looking at how we can engage, not necessarily with people who have mobility issues, but different diverse groups, you know, targeting the music. So it's it's working with other people. It's a It's a really exciting program to be part of, really, and to see how even if this is the taster for what the sector needs to do, let us share our learnings and help sector change. 
Yeah, because it does, it does feel like, like you mentioned music, like it feels like you can go in a lot of different directions in terms of partnerships or using certain types of, I guess, hooks to get more people engaged. Like, how came back to your previous role, Shelley? You know, when you came in data and insights, you mentioned obviously where software company was like to think about data and how you manage that. Have you got a way of kind of tracking what your, I guess, the deliverables or is there anything you need to report on from a data point of view for around the project? Yeah, we do. Um, we've got a number of metrics that we report on in terms of, you know, courses that are run, Courses that courses that get cancelled in terms of numbers of instructors that book on, people that transfer, people that again, you know, people that are accessing the system, people that are, you know, so there's a whole range of things that we track. We're not tracking the number of participants because that's actually a it's a byproduct of what we're doing. We we need to train up as many instructors as possible and to support those instructors to then get those courses listed on the Bisco Can classes website. So that's another metric that we track is the number of classes that are listed on the website against numbers of instructors that have that are trained and, and which instructors have activated or centers have activated and which haven't. And then the the kind of participation side of it is that's more outside of our control, but we're obviously supporting partners to promote and market the the product but yeah there's a whole host of things that we would report on as well as you know various things we're fortunate with the support from sport england to be able to offer the training at a reduced rate so again kind of uptake of the the bursary funding for the scale can classes instructor training but we also even are now tracking to an even smaller kind of more detail is around which marketing materials are people downloading from the marketing hub what are they using are they using the static ads the carousel ads are they using the posters are they are they requesting a pop-up banner so we can start to see which marketing materials work better as well and not just across the board but where is it in more rural communities or is it that leisure centers are after this type of marketing material community instructors want more posters for example so we're trying to now get to a point where we can start to track that so that when we're developing new content we can develop the stuff that we know people want but also can start to look at how it's being used and how effective it is as well yeah that sounds awesome I mean, obviously you kind of got that toolkit based on wherever demographic yep. the instructors working within it's fantastic just switching gears a little bit more towards like i guess commercially what would you say the biggest opportunities are at the moment in the sector i'll put them to i don't know where you got a, a thought Ooh. on that or, the, or maybe no, you, the can that, you can take that one <laughs> yeah i think i think that's a it's a difficult one at the moment because obviously the set the sector sport and physical activity are struggling at the moment we know there's a lot of operators out there there's a lot of boutiques that have gone under there's a lot of uh, solo industry like studios that are falling under par at the moment i think they're folding the, the truth of the pandemic is it's it's this financial impact on it and i think we've got a big struggle going on at the moment at looking at how we you know people are questioning going to a leisure centre or to classes because the cost of petrol to get to it. I think yeah. that it, it's not necessarily a solution. I think we've got to navigate this next couple of months of the financial crisis to support and, and see different ways that we can engage with people. That's going to be our hardest thing. Opportunities, I just think we just need to get people back in. We've had a big consumer confidence crisis coming back mm. in. I think we've done one of our recent surveys say that most people are working at 75% occupancy still compared to pre, pre-pandemic. Yeah. So it's... Do you think that's got... Is that to do with like the flight to online stuff or the fitness apps or the, the, the kind of self-service type... Well, I do think there's part of it. However, our, our also recent survey showed that only out of the people who were doing online during the pandemic, only 40% of those people are still continuing to do it. They've actually gone back, kind of gone, oh, I'll go back to normal, mm. where I think there is still the opportunity to actually do a blend of both. And I think instructors need to look at that is if we are struggling to reach people during the pandemic, group exercise grew massively right we were the the one of the ones who rotated 360 went online and got people come to classes that had never come to classes before the stay in workout campaign worked everything like that going back to what we did before great for some people because that's what they want to do and stay with it but i think that blend allows us of the live and it can be you doing face-to-face classes and just recording it so people can attend at home yeah. but i think you we've got to look at that opportunity of tech to help support those people who don't want to necessarily come out or want to be engaged in physical activity and just want to do it from their home it's a balance isn't it so yeah it's, finding, it's trying to find a balance because i think as well what we can't do is there's a, a fine line and a decision to be had around if people start to deliver stuff online especially from a, like a leisure center perspective in terms of delivering stuff online and removing mm-hmm. that physical instructor because a lot of people that want to go to classes physically is because they want somebody physically standing in front of them oh, so, yeah. so you're talking about the so, setting but with the screen up with the, yeah the so that, that's another people, and that's another, the, and that's another dynamic in terms, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's just another dynamic in terms of how how technology has evolved is we've not just got you know things like peloton and 
people being online on Zoom or, or whatever, but actually you've got, you know, some centres pivoting to digital delivery as well. I suppose that's and, probably and, easy to manage for a centre if, they, if well, they're struggling course. to get the instructors of, in. Of, or... of course, of course. But at the same time, it may be putting members off. And I think that's where yeah. having that insight into the customer base is massively important for any any provider. You've got to know your customer. You've got to know what they want and be able to provide the right the right tools, the right uh, services, the right products, haven't you? So yeah, I think absolutely that's agree. Yeah, I mean, I'm, for me personally, I'm craving getting back to face to face. I'll start to go back to face to face classes. So that's it, it's finding out what that clientele needs and not kind of something again I spoke about last week was don't assume what you're thinking is what they want. You need to actually, the operators need to go out and go, this one size fit all approach doesn't necessarily work. You need to have a look at what your catchment area is and what those people want. Ask those people who come, what do they want? Are they happy with the online? Do they want face to face? And what classes they want. I've got two centres near me and one's doing it great and one's not. One's stuck with online. And I think they're going, well, my numbers aren't great, so we're not going to bring back teachers. And I'm like, your numbers aren't great because you're not bringing back teachers. So you've got to take that balance of. So I think there's opportunities of, I think that the model of Group X in operators will need to change in the coming year, especially in the next year or so, to look at how we support instructors as well. Barely want to touch on it, but this is, you know, they haven't had a pay increase for 20 years. So, but what can we do that if an operator doesn't have the money, which completely understand at the moment, because we're coming out of a pandemic, how do we all support an instructor? How do we make an instructor feel worthwhile? You know, what, why do they want to feel valued? Do they need to feel valued to do it? Instructors, I can tell you, most people who went out to start teaching Group X, just wanted to be in front of people to help support them. Most of those people during the pandemic at first gave their services for free because it just wanted to help people. So there's a way of being valued in your worth. Yes, we want to be paid more, but what other services can we provide an instructor in an operator or in a boutique to actually make them feel valued? It is really difficult because speaking about our colleagues from a kind of sport and physical activity, especially children's area, there's this kind of drive, same like you said, Pay increases are not in well, like like most sectors as well. It's not in line with obviously cost of living, inflation, etc. Yeah. But also, there's almost like a, a push towards increasing skills. So additional costs, loads of CPD, more and more. But then there's not kind of, it doesn't kind of track in terms of earning potential. So it's yeah, it's a difficult one to to work through, isn't it? There's an opportunity as well, though, isn't there, around actually just changing things up a little bit as well because I think that sport kind of if you look at sport for me like clubs are delivering the same sort of stuff they were delivering when I first got into sports development they're structured in the same sort of way they've got this kind of annual membership maybe maybe some of them have, have got rolling memberships maybe they've they've changed things up a little bit and got a little bit more a little bit more dynamic but actually you know perhaps we need to think more habits people's habits have changed everybody's time is squeezed we've got different responsibilities we've got different pressures on our time different things have become important to us as as life goes on Okay, so again, it's, we've got to start thinking about how do we take those opportunities to perhaps try new things and do something different. And that might be changing up something like membership structures, or it might be like doing something dynamic with your timetabling. It's just trying to think differently about delivery in respect of trying to get people in because people have generally got less time now. So they don't necessarily have an hour for a class. So actually, how do we change that up? And that's why some of the stuff like, you know, Peloton has, has worked quite well because you can go on and do a 10 minute class in your own living room and it's easy. Yeah. But I think we've just got to think differently as a sector to provide a, a range of opportunities. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say, in terms of that, Peloton's a great one. Like you mentioned, it depends what activity you're delivering, what type of class you're doing, because I think Peloton, the the spin bike, it like lends itself really well, right? So it's just static. I don't just need the bike and I can get, I'm in the kind of environment, but then maybe less so with the other type of activities that they, the other type of sessions that they're offering or classes they're offering. But I think their model, I don't know, I'm curious to think what to hear what you think, because instructors are this their own business right generally self-employed instructors and they're kind of contracted to and they're moving around that kind of the way that peloton market their instructors and kind of make them superstars right that if, mm-hmm. if you could have that superstar status but move around and and um kind of leverage that maybe that'd be just in my eyes it feels like a great opportunity for, a, for an instructor now if, they, if they're great at what they do but it's also if you would if you were delivering now you'd probably be able to leverage a lot of all that all, all of your brand uh, yeah. your personal brand and all, and all kind of your uh, expertise and, and notoriety into that yeah definitely yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a fan. I've, I've got a Peloton bike. I have, I've put my hand up. Is that bad? To say? I have got I have got a Peloton bike. But you know what? I use the app more than the bike because the app's got a whole host of different different types of group exercise stuff, which just it just fits well for my lifestyle in terms of needing shorter snippet when I can do them without having to drive somewhere to do it. So it just works. That's not going to work for everybody. But I think that as that as a model is is different, isn't it? To to a lot of things that that are out there. And and actually, the qual- the quality of it is 
the streaming and stuff like that is, is good. They put a lot of money into it. But I know they were looking to open up some live studios as well, which hasn't happened. I don't know the reasons why. But that, that, that again, bite size is, is good as well in terms yeah. of, like we're talking about working from home and stuff like that. That exactly. even exercise, not just for kind of fitness, it's like stress relief is I just yeah. need to do 10 minutes. I'm yeah. I just back yeah. to work. I'm stuck in the yeah. house all day. And some people, I remember having this conversation during the pandemic, people were like, oh, you know, all these people have monopolized Group X and they're taking it away from Group X. I looked at the, the flip side. These apps and these programs that they've done, the on-demands, have actually got people engaged in activity that weren't engaged in activity before. So they're providing us in an operator setting or in a community setting as an instructor more opportunities because at some point they might go, well, I'm engaged now. I've kind of got myself a little bit fitter. I want to go to a face-to-face class. So it's not. I don't see it as a detractor. I see this as a, an like extended like, um, yeah. growth. A linear growth is like we're engaging with people here and therefore we can take it through up to here. It's a pathway that, that of a journey of a participant. So it's a try not to sit in there, the, the mindset of like, okay, this is taking away work from us. This is actually what can you put on that? Your marketing could be around that. It's like, yeah. have you done this? How about I come and engage this and meet more people in your community? Feeling, you know, that's nothing will ever take away community feel when you say Yeah, no, I'd agree. I'd agree, but it also allows people to try something out on their own if they're self-conscious in their own home. Which yeah. I think is really important. Yeah, yeah definitely. So get, like what we say in, in the kind of software words, like on ramp, so it gets you gets you in involved, and then you might have to go from there and, exactly. and get your own journey. Yep. Switching gears slightly to a bit more, uh, not personal, but in terms of your approach to business and, and leading teams, and curious. Obviously, you've you've got vast experience, works in loads of different loads of different partners, sectors, different roles. Is there anything that you've kind of collected along your way, and you've kind of developed a certain strategy approach concept to, to how you lead a team how you deliver a project and like that. i mean i i like to bring my teams together i like to and that could be virtually or physically i don't for me it doesn't necessarily matter but i always like to give people the opportunity to be engaged and to be heard and to, to i make sure i listen to them because i think that for me i've always worked best leading a team I'm, I'm within a team as well when i you know been in teams myself and been led by somebody else when we've been given some freedom to to really engage and come forward and put ideas forward. And I think it's really important to hear from people, not just to direct. So kind of, I, I have quite, a, I guess, quite a collaborative leadership style, I, I think, to, to try and get the best out of everybody and understanding people's strengths, mm-hmm. but also importantly, understanding their areas for development. Because if you can understand their areas for development, then that that can become a strength and and supporting them to to grow, I think is is important to me. I think that's why Shelley and I get on because we do exactly the same thing. <laughs> I'm very much the same as you. I'm try to lead by example as well it's yep. I expect them you know like I, I I'm not like you do I want to inspire them to be creative I tr- I want to be able to get to the point where with, with I can trust them I you know like I want you to go away go and do your job I know you're awesome what you do go and shine Brit, trust it and I'll just bring me back the results and if you need me but my team hopefully realize they can come at me at any time and kind of go I need you for this they, they trust me in the point of they know that if something goes wrong they can come to me straight away without feeling they're going to you know, be held accountable too much for it. It's like, this is about a team. And I, I'm very much about a team. My team, although we're spread across the country, we try and meet in the office once a month because I believe your relationships are better face-to-face. But we're very much, set, I think Shelley and I are very much the same how we work with our teams. It's, yeah, it's, trust, uh, is, it's yeah. trust and a teamwork effort. You yeah, know, so we're, we're the ones who steer the ship, but actually everyone, we, you're not standing behind me, we're standing together. Yeah. We're standing together because... Take, for example, last week at Elevate, there was only a certain amount of us at a trade show, but the effort the team have gone into behind hand from design to anything, that's all valued. That makes us to so every person's little bit of work they might be doing. And that leads us to be able to do with the stuff that we create. So yeah, it definitely sounds like 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 an empowering environment, right? You've got, you've yeah, got a vision. Like to, and I, yeah, them. I'd like to think so. I think yeah. trust is massively important, especially with people working remotely, because you have to be able to trust that people are just getting on with stuff. But yeah. kind of having that open door policy, I think, is really important. Do you guys have any routines that you use so day to day? Do you put anything in place? Do you have a certain <laughs> set thing that and I'm I'm, wait, I'm waiting to I'm, do like two or three I'm classes laughing, a day? And I'm, I'm like, laughing what? because I I'm laughing because I put a, I put a plan in. It probably goes out the window about half an hour after I get it's good going when all the other folks will start coming in. I think that's the same as every, yeah, everyone. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think. Or, for or me, is there I'm anything like, that you used used to try and try and keep on top form, keep the stress down, and uh, what what is it that you kind of always go to for that? Do you know what I've noticed for myself is that if I, if I'm ever sat on a 
a conundrum or I don't want to say a problem because these things aren't necessarily problems, but something that I'm just struggling to unlock is actually stepping away, step away from the computer. I've, I might take the dogs for a short walk, for example. That helps me just to sometimes find solutions where I've been struggling if I've just been sat at the screen or just can't quite get my head around something. Stepping away, I think, is for me, for me, that works. I, you know, listen, I use Outlook, we use Asana as a project management tool. I've got a to do list, which is <laughs> just gets longer and longer. But I think the one thing that I would do if I'm really kind of struggling to to, yeah, to find a solution or to unpick something is, is step away. Or you pick up the phone to Shelley and go, Shell! <laughs> and then I have to step away and come back to speak. <laughs> <Yeah. to> Offload <laughs> off quickly. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, we've all tried during the pandemic. <laughs> I think how we worked, personally, everyone's worked prior to a pandemic, during a pandemic, and trying to navigate out of a pandemic. We're just all trying to work out what works best for everybody because it mm. is a different way that we used to work. I used to always be the right, this is my list. This is the top three I want to chew off today. And this is the big one that I need to get meaty into. It's, it's something that Shelley uses as a chew the frog, wasn't it? Was the, yeah, eat the frog. Eat the frog. <laughs> chew the frog. Yeah, chew it. <laughs> I don't want to do it. <laughs> chew it. It's, a bit, it's a bit gooey. It's frog legs. I have a little bit of an afterbite. They, I procrastinate on it. But I think there's the, um, you know, like trying to set yourself three tasks to achieve the day so it's not overwhelming is a good aim. Sometimes I sit there and go, I haven't even chewed off any of that. I've not even started on it because something else has come in. And, and being able to kind of go, okay, well, that does have to park for now because this is a priority and always that check and challenge of is this my priority right now to get that end goal and the big picture thinking but I'm Shelley I think again if I'm stuck on something I get my trainers on and go out for a run I go out on the bike go for a swim anything just to clear the head and step away because sometimes that rigid eight or four or nine to five doesn't work you wake up one day and you're not creative you need to move I need to move to be able to I, I sometimes lunch times will go for a swim and halfway through the swim I'm going oh I know how to solve that problem now. It's come to me during that thing because I've stepped away chasing a blue line and in that headspace, I've, that creative juice has started flowing. It's just come to me. It's frustrating in the in a pool, right? Because you can't write down what the solution is. <laughs> but I've got home, you've forgotten it. But I think that's very important post-pandemic, especially when you're working virtually, is it's I'm a victim of just sitting here and trying to do it and it's not working, not working, to learn to there's other ways around it, step away from what you're doing. And speak to other people as well, right? Because we do bounce things. It might be like sometimes, you know, for example, Sue and I might come to each other with a problem which is not related to my work area. It might not be related to Sue's work area. It might be something entirely different. But sometimes just having a conversation with somebody who said isn't in it yeah, can help because they can give a different perspective. So you mentioned then running, swimming, biking. So do you do, you do triathlon, right? Yeah. How do you fit that training in then? Is that is that something you've got like that's scheduled called, that, into your work day? Is that, that on your that to-do list as well? A, yeah, that, that's called a routine. I, Shelley knows I've just stepped away from doing my 70.3. I was meant to be doing an Ironman this year, but I've made the decision to step back. It's not the right time this year for it. But in evaluating stepping back from doing that, I will say triathlon saved my life throughout the whole pandemic because it was an excuse to get out and train. It was, uh, I had to stop. So actually- You're getting two extra sessions, like, not like the rest of us, with just one walk a day. Yeah, yeah well- been cheeky. <laughs> well, at peak, I was doing 14 to 16 hours of training. So it was just about getting up early, getting your training done then mm. and doing it after work. It probably helped sandwich my work each time. I think it provided a structure. And I'm I'm very much a structured. I need I need that structure. So I just turn up. Training peaks tells me I have to do this. Off I go and get it done. So yeah, yeah. I'm a bit like that. I like to have a training plan. I've gone the other way, Sue, haven't I? You've decided yeah. to postpone yours, and I've decided to ramp mine up. <laughs> Nice. So you Perfect. might be a race, an internal race then? No, definitely. Not. It's not triathlon for me. Just right. just running and cycling for me. I don't, <laughs> I'm not, I'll, I'll swim on holiday, but yeah, I don't swim in this country, really. But uh, yeah, just running and cycling. Nice. Guys, I really appreciate your time. I've got one more question for both of you, if you can. It's a little bit of a reflective one, and we always ask everyone the same question. It comes onto the pod. If you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, so you got and give your younger self one piece of advice, maybe when you're leaving school or starting your career, what would that piece of advice be? Ooh, enjoy the journey for me I think for, for me that life has been like a roller literally has been like a roller coaster but at every stage whether it's a positive or negative you learn from it and you grow from it so it's taking it, if I'd known earlier on that everything I did built me to what I do today I would enjoy the journey a little bit more so for me it's that it's that's an overriding life thing for me is even when I had a really bad experience in a, a job that I've but done I can go away and go but what's the positive from it I learned this and I learned that I didn't want to do that and I do like to do this so for me it's 
enjoy the journey and everything you're doing builds you to who you are right now and just keep moving forward don't get stuck if it's not right for you move forward yeah, yeah. You, you're right. it's difficult to difficult to not focus on the end point all the time that's what people get yeah. stuck with isn't it yeah. yeah i think i i think i'd say take take the opportunities as they arise because i think that taking different opportunities along my way has clearly led me to where I am now. And some of those opportunities have felt a little bit risky. Companies I've gone to work for that I'd never even heard of before they offered me a job. <laughs> okay, we'll give this a crack. It looks quite looks quite quite good, quite interesting. So I think take the opportunity, but also not just from a job perspective, but kind of experiences, people, you know, asking you to speak at stuff. You you never know how being how speaking at something when you're on a stage or when you're at the age of 21 can really massively build your confidence to be able to be a good public speaker throughout your career. And that's the sort of thing that then get, can get you noticed and will, you know, build your build your personal brand and, and give you more opportunities as well. So that's something that I'd say kind of, yeah, take, yeah. take yeah, the get, opportunity. Get, yeah, I was going to say, take the, get, out, get out of your yeah. comfort zone. and Yeah, and, um, yeah literally, yeah, get out of your grow, comfort right? zone. Stop, stop limiting what you can do by your what's in your head. Just step yeah. out of it because yeah. everyone says to me, oh, you, you know, like when you go, oh, you did that speech. How did you feel? I was like, if you really knew how I felt five minutes before I went on that stage, yeah. no one wants to do it, but you do it because some people go, I remember you when you did this at this stage. So it's- Yeah, they do. They do. That public speaking thing, James, is, I think is, is massively important. I mean, I've, I've been doing it since I was in school. So I'll stand on any stage alongside anybody and I'll, and I'll speak. That's not, that's not a problem. But it, that really helps you. It helps you when you go for interviews. It helps you p- pick up new opportunities to expand your networks. And, um, you know, I've worked in jobs before where I've had managers that are not comfortable public speaking. So I've taken on that role and people have thought that I have led that department when I wasn't at the time. So I think all of these things, you know, mm-hmm. for me, take the opportunities just give it a crack do you know what just give it a try yeah, yeah. no i love that thank you so much for giving up all your time today no i um, really enjoyed it in terms of joining and links to emd all that'll be in the show in the show notes if there's anything else that um you guys want to promote or share we'll get that in the show notes as well but really appreciate your time and thanks for coming on to the show today no problem thanks james yeah thanks james thank you for listening to this week's show you can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts if you'd like to get in touch with us you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports, or on my account at james underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport.